Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Networking in Florida, the Ethical Do's and Don'ts. This is part two of our training series that we've called um, Navigating the Networking Niche. This is a three-part training series, part one being on networking, uh, the who's and the what's and the why's, part two uh, being on, on our ethics, um, and part three coming your way in June. So for those of you who have joined us in previous sessions, welcome back. For those of you who are new to the training series, series welcome aboard. Uh, my name is Alexis Alvarez Bartholomew, a director of statewide training at Florida Legal Services. And I'm really, really, really happy to be here to talk to you about this subject that is not talked about enough in legal aid world, in our, our public interest, in our pro bono world, um, because we often feel that networking isn't uh, something that we need to do. But the reality is, is networking is, is so important to what we do as lawyers, as professionals, and as people, right? Um, so I'm very happy to be here with you to talk about this. Uh, before we move into the introductions of our speaker and then move into the content, um, I do wanna mention some housekeeping announcements. As mentioned before, this is a three-part training series, parts two, this part, and part three in June are collectively combined for CLE credit, including professionalism uh, credits and ethics credits in addition to general uh, CLE credits. So stick with us today, come back to us in June, and I will announce that CLE code that will get you all of those <clears throat> credits. Second piece of housekeeping announcements, questions and answers. Um, really important, we wanna hear from you. This is a conversation that we don't often get to speak to an expert about, um, because we think, you know, it's either you have it or you don't, you network or you don't, and that's just not true. We have an expert here, ask your questions, don't be shy. I guarantee you there's somebody else in the virtual vortex thinking about the same question that you have. Uh, third piece of housekeeping announcements, um, closed captions. Those are up for anybody who does need that extra accessibility. If you have any issues, I'll drop my email into the chat. Happy to help you figure that out. I know with Zoom and updates and all the things that change, it might be a little difficult. And so moving into the introduction of who we have here today, again, for those of you who are with us in part one, uh, we have with us again, Dr. Carol Shiro Greenwald, who is a marketing and management strategist, trainer, and business development coach. She works with professionals and professional service firms to structure and implement growth programs that are targeted, strategic, and practical. Carol helps individuals and firms structure their practice around their clients, I highly, highly recommend that you check out her books, Strategic Networking for Introverts, Extroverts, and Everyone in Between, and uh, her other book, Build Your Practice the Logical Way, Maximize Your Client Relationships. So before I turn it over to Carol, I'm going to mention that I'll drop those book links into the chat. I will also drop a resource list that we put together of some ethics opinions um, and some social media opinions. I'm going to drop that into the chat as well, um, and my email, like I promised. And so with that being said, um, Carol, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking the time to teach us. We're very excited to learn from you today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about this. People think ethics is dull. I think ethics is, is essential if you wanna stay an independent, self-regulated profession. So let's talk about it. But first, a refresher on networking. For, I don't know about you, but I can't remember two days back, so. I just thought I'd put two slides in that reminded you, networking is not random acts of lunch. Networking is strategic. It means you have an intentional strategy about who you want to meet, why you want to meet them, what you want to happen. And it's goal-driven. So you need a set of SMART goals, goals that are strategic, that are possible to do, that are um, specific. And you're going to use that process to create the personal relationships that you need in order to create trust relationships with people in order to have those people hire or refer you. People don't hire strangers. People hire people, as you know, they know, like, and feel um, safe with. So that is a process. You don't meet someone once and then go, oh, gee, I love them, you know? I just think that I'll marry them tomorrow. No, it's a long process. And so is networking because you're trying to create those close relationships. Again, why network? Because as far as I'm concerned, it's the funnest thing you can do uh, because it has great rewards. Uh, 
my best friends, my colleagues, allies, people who've helped me in the world. And of course, uh, my personal friends, most of them have come through networking. Um, I had two husbands and I now have a partner and they all came through networking. Uh, whether I did it or other people did it for me, didn't matter, would not have happened without networking. Um, it's how people learn about not only what you do, but how you do it, who you really are by getting to know you within groups. And so it raises your visibility within the groups of people that you know, and then the prospects that they know. It's a fabulous way to learn new things. If you don't learn new things, even law gets boring. And, oh, excuse me, one second. Are you, you're, Alexa, you're going you're gonna to follow the um, yep. chat, right? Okay. Yep, yep, and that's me. I just put uh, some things into the chat and I will follow it throughout and make sure we bring stuff up. Thank you. No okay. problem. So it's a great way to subtly grow your brand and your reputation by showcasing your expertise, answering questions that you can answer, becoming a thought leader in something about law that you really love. And so you do the research and you know all about it. One of my friends is a thought leader on cyber privacy in the home. And he just loves nothing better than talking about it till he's blue in the face and um, writing terrific blogs and stuff. And it's a much easier way of learning it than having to do all the hard work yourself. You know, he kind of has digested it for us. It's also a way of meeting referral sources and other service providers. I don't know about you, but my clients think they can ask me about any service in the world and I'll know somebody. I may not, but I know somebody who knows somebody. And so I'll be able to find them almost anything that they need. And finally, it's a way of building your business where you're in control of that build and where you can take charge of where your career takes you. You may wanna stay in, in public interest law the rest of your life, but you may wanna stay in it doing something different, somewhere different, or you may want to become one of the leaders of the Florida public, public um, what do you call it, public interest group. And either way, you need to meet people. You need to know people so that you can create that trajectory in a knowing way. And finally, it can be fun. So why are ethics rules important? That's what we're gonna talk about first. Well, ethics rules are important because lawyers are self-policed. Accountants are not self-policed. They are regulated by government rules because they were created by the government in their modern form in the uh, 1920s, when all of a sudden there were all these things going on in finance and nobody knew what the heck was going on. And so audits were invented. So they don't need this kind of self-policing, but we do. Therefore, the, the rules are not only there, but they're very specific. They are so detailed in many ways. You wanna just wonder what they were thinking. What they were thinking was, is we wanna make sure you do it exactly how we say, because otherwise they're gonna come after us and say, we don't know how to do it. Also professionalism is important because professionalism means that you, you the lawyer embody the concept of professionalism just by being and talking and meeting people. You're gonna talk about the rule of law. You're gonna talk about how courts work. You're gonna talk about how anybody can avail themselves of legal resources. And in that way, you build knowledge and you build acceptance of the democratic form of government that we have. And finally, my favorite thing about professionalism is it keeps you from being thought of the same way plumbers are. Because in many ways, the way in which clients find you, use you and leave you is similar to how we use plumbers. So how do we use plumbers? There's a leak in the kitchen. We have no idea what it is. We call the plumber and we say, you have to fix it right this minute. The plumber comes over, takes him five minutes, fixes it, you get a bill for $500. Why? Well, because you could do it in two minutes and the same with us. Somebody has a crisis, somebody has a problem, they, their house is foreclosed, their um, husband is beating them, their, um, they had a car accident, whatever it is. They were not expecting to call a lawyer. It's not something they do on a regular basis. They call a lawyer, they hire the lawyer. 
the lawyer fixes it in ways they don't understand because practically no one who watches law on TV knows how law really works. They know that on TV within an hour, it all gets settled. So let's start laughing right there. And then uh, you send them a bill and they go, what? $5,000. All I wanted to do was get my car back or my house back or my husband gone at $5,000. Same thing, same reaction. And then they go away again. It's not like a continuing relationship in most cases. But we have professionalism and that makes us professionals. And professionals in America are a separate class in the way people think about them. Some people hate us, some people love us, but whatever it is, professionals are above white collar and blue collar people in the way people think about it. And that's a, that's a marvelous marketing base for us. And you know, Carol, thinking thinking about that, I, you know, it, I, it's true. In the day to day, when you're constantly just working and 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 doing what you do, you think of being a lawyer as your job, right? It's your job. And this is a great reminder and a great way to frame the conversation that we're going to have. That you know, when we say it's the practice of law and we talk about it as a profession, not just your job, as a profession with duties not only to you, to your client, but to overall the status of being a lawyer in the profession of lawyerism right <laughs> they were <Exactly. laughs> <the word. laughs> but um I, I i agree with that and i think it's a great reminder to remember when we're especially when we're talking about ethics we're putting on our our lawyer hat and we're wearing our as our profession you know every single day and you know it reminds me um a, a couple of months ago a, a friend of mine is, was the marketing um, director for a firm that i used to be the marketing director for. So we both knew all the people. And all of a sudden the firm was in the paper because one of the associates had gotten drunk, was walking in uh, New York City in the village, pulled the wig off a black performer, made inappropriate statements. Now he was drunk, made inappropriate statements, um, laughed about it, refused to give the wig back, made her chase him, blah, 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 blah. That was 10 o'clock at night. By midnight, he was fired. By midnight, two hours later. Why? Because he screwed up professionalism. So it's not something that doesn't happen. It's not something that isn't stupid. This was a guy who was on the track, maybe to be a partner. He was a really good litigator. Now, everywhere he goes, just like that poor lawyer who had a cat instead of a face on a Zoom call, that's how people remember them, right? When he dies, what's the first line not be? Not he was a fabulous lawyer or litigator, but he was the guy who pulled the wig off a known performer, black woman. So not it's really real. Wow. Another reason that it's important besides putting teeth in it is when they were writing the ethics rules, and I remember some of them go back to the early um, 20th century. Their notion was, was that people were too naive, average people, to really understand law or what was going on, whereas lawyers were trained, trained in the art of talking and winning through, through speech. And so a, a lawyer could come and just jump on some client who's in a crisis or have an advertisement that just made them feel so emotionally upset that they would hire the lawyer without any rational involvement. And so it's to protect naive clients. I'm not so sure our clients are so naive these days, but I do think there's a lot of ignorance about what the law is. And that's why some of these to a lawyer look really stupid. Think about them from the client point of view. Do they protect people who never have anything to do with law? And that's particularly a lot of your clients. They think that the law is a policeman on the corner who's gonna rat them out or send them away or do something else that they have no understanding of. So law is not a friendly thing to many of your clients. It's to protect them and to give them the space to learn about what they need to learn about. It also is a way of making sure that anything that you can attach back to a lawyer can be checked. Uh, it can be fact checked. It's real, it's clear, it's trackable, it's findable. It's not he's cute. That does not go in ethics. Because one person's cute is another person's, I wish he'd cut his hair. So you don't know. 
ethics rules make sure that lawyers in dealing with humans, they want to hire them, provide data that is clear and that can be checked. Again, it reinforces the professionalism notion. So now before we talk about ethics, let's ask you a question. Your turn, Alexis. All right, this is my time to shine, everybody. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right, audience question one being launched. And I will read it out loud. Um, the question is, have you read the marketing ethics section of the rules regulating the Florida bar? And so I'll give folks a few uh, seconds to answer. We've had the poll open for about 15 seconds. So maybe give it to about 30. We have 10 more seconds. I love this power. My like, 10 more seconds. <laughs> Control it. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. And I'm going to share the results. And so what I see here is that about 18% of us say yes, 27% say some of us, 55% say no, that they have not read the rules. <laughs> okay, it's fine until you decide to start marketing. And then it may not be so fine. <laughs> um, because some of these rules are so picky that it's really easy, just in normal life to become a foul of them. Okay, so now, okay, now what's happening? Oh, you're gonna end up having to step in because it doesn't want to go. Okay, give us one, oh, maybe wait, three minutes there. On. There we go. Perfect. Okay. The rules that we're gonna be talking about are the rules regulating the Florida bar 4-7.11 through um, 20, actually through 2021. So um, we're going to talk about them now. This is a little boring. So just yeah, got to hang with me because otherwise, if we don't get through this part of it, the rest of it doesn't make a lot of sense. These rules are very, very broad. They catch anybody talking to anyone about law, but they only apply to Florida. Lawyers who um, can legally practice in Florida whether they, they've um, passed the bar in Florida or whether there's someone like an immigration attorney who only does federal law and can practice there or lawyers in other cities who can practice in Florida if they want to and are advertising there. Otherwise not. If you cross over into any other Southern state, doesn't apply. So it's just Florida. And when you look at the 50 states, Florida, um, rules are very uh, tight and old fashioned and um, want you to do what they want you to do. And they don't care if you don't want to do it or not. So advertisement, as in the, in the ABAs, it's all forms of communication, all forms, anything. You're on a chat, you're on Slack, you're um, in a Zoom. You're in a coffee shop, you're on the phone, you're texting any form of communication in person or electronic seeking legal employment, whether it's written or spoken. And it applies, as I just told you, to everybody either admitted in Florida or providing services in Florida and who target advertisements in order to tell people about that. So. It also includes communication that you might not think it does to referral sources. And the reason they say this as a special thing is because in all of these cases, there are two groups who are not um, covered. One is other lawyers on the assumption that other lawyers can hold their own against a lawyer and understand everything being said. So no need to protect them and clients, future, I mean, cur current and past clients. Future clients are protected. But so if a lawyer sends a marketing piece just to past clients and current clients, it's not advertising. If the lawyer opens it up and sends it to other people's clients, that's advertising. So pretty simple. Just assume whenever you open your mouth, it's an advertisement. Okay. Now we have a thousand versions of what you cannot say. There are, I think, three of these that have to do with what you cannot say. The first one is also the one that's in the national guidelines, and that is deceptive or inherently misleading. 
So deceptive is you you know you you say that's that's easy. You, you say that uh, twelve people work with you, and you're a solo. That's deceptive. And if what you mean is you talk to your friends about your cases, that doesn't count for the purposes of advertising. Inherently misleading is the one that catches people all the time. So think about litigators who say, um, we have uh, won our last 25 litigations. One to a human being means the person got what they wanted. One to a lawyer does not necessarily mean that. It could mean you got it um, thrown out. It could mean that you had a less than perfect um, solution, but it was solved because you, you um, negotiated it. Could mean all varieties of things leading up to 100% of what the client wanted. So it's misleading. Or many firms say that we have 100 years of legal experience. That doesn't mean that there's a 101-year-old man there. What that means is that in the firm, if I add up all the years that people in the firm have been lawyers, it's 100. And so we have 100 years of experience. To a human, it they don't think about it, meaning the second thing. So it's a little difficult. So you have to be sure that when you're describing things, you don't put in any information that is not necessary. Because it's it's every time you add an adjective or a qualifier, you're risking running a, a, a foul of this rule. Now, there's two kinds of uh, language that is okay. And you need to remember this for marketing purposes. It's really important. One is aspirational. I strive to get the best result I can for my client instead of I can get the best result. Um, my goal is to make the litigation process as easy and um, unstressful as possible. You don't say, I make it. You say, it's my goal to do this. If I can, I will. If I can, I won't. And then for things where you want to say something that could be deceptive if it were a clear statement, add language that modifies it. So you're going to try to do something. You're going to seek it. You may be or you might or you could do it. All of these words protect you from what's deceptive or inherently misleading. Another and thing to remember is there are certain words to never use. Don't use better, don't use best, don't use much, don't use more, don't use many, none of those because they cannot be factually proven. Did you that makes that? me think, yeah, that makes me think, Carol, you know, it, it's similar to when we're talking to our client, right? Like we're just talking to our client about their potential outcome, what we're able to do for them, what we're not able to do for them. It sort of tracks the same language. You know, right. you don't want to overpromise. You don't want to promise things that you can't. Um, and you want to be prudent when you're talking to your client about what is actually able to happen, right? right. But, but think about billboard signs. Um, they, they don't have enough, you know, room on the billboard to put in the modifier language. So, you know, we win for you. No, no, that's not legal. Now, does anybody catch them? Probably not, because the way in which these things come to the ethics committee is another lawyer who's a competitor rats you out. Otherwise, they never come. I'm sure you can all think of language you've seen that violates this. It's so easy to find. In fact, there's a website called Lawyer Advertising. If you're ever in the mood for a laugh, just go on there and look at what some people actually say in public. It's mind boggling. So potentially misleading means that you could believe it says one thing and I could believe it says another. So they wanna make sure that you have accurate language. So accurate language means that they can find it. How many years you've been a lawyer, what year you graduated from law school, where you went to college, what you practice in, where you practice, how many people in your firm, et cetera, et cetera. Things that I can go and find. I can look it up, see if you're right. I mean, you may want to tell me you're 10 years younger than you are, but I can check because it's public when you graduated from law school. It's actually public what your birth date is. But if I can't find that, I can find that when you graduated. And that's telling me enough stuff. So, sorry about that. Hold on, I'm trying to get rid of it. Okay, 
So um, one of the things that um, is a personal no-no of mine with my clients is, you know how you get these things in the mail and they say, let us give you a plaque that says you're a number one lawyer in um, matrimonial divorce, you're a number one lawyer in real estate, et cetera. You know, $500 and there's your plaque. A lot of people fall for it. I got to tell you, the um, shit detector in most human beings notices right away that the language is not the same as your pot five beta kappa or you got into the federal, you know, you're a member of the federal bar or you're in one of the special groups. Unless you're board certified, board certified, we know what that means. We have know what doctors mean when they're board certified. So we know what lawyers mean. And board certified is fine, but you have to be board certified under the Florida plan or the ABA plan or another accepted one under another state bar. You can't just say you're board certified. But the first one really bugs me because so many people do it and they put them up in their offices and they shouldn't. If you get into super lawyers, that's legit. If you get into um, Bess, that's legit. If you get into Martindale, that's legit. What makes it legit is, is that we know how they pick people. We can read it, we can see it, they show us the whole process. Now, is there a bit of favoritism in it as a marketing person who was often tasked with making as many people in the firm I work for get them as possible? Yes, of course there is. Of course, in super lawyers where you vote once for yourself and four times for people, other people, of course you can work that so that people in your firm get there. It's just sort of like poker. But on the other hand, they do get it and more people apply for those than actually get it. So, and you can track it. It tells you how super lawyers figures is super. You can't use the word specialist and expert unless you've gone through extra training. And if you're gonna talk about your fees, you have to do two things. One is describe them all. So one of the things I see often on PI websites is no cost unless we win. That's not true usually. Usually you have to pay the costs of depositions and finding materials and all those kinds of things. Whether you win or not, some firms don't, but most firms do. So you can't say that there's no cost if you don't win. There's no fee for the lawyer if you don't win, but you're gonna pay for all of the things that they do ahead of time. So you have to say that. Also, you have to maintain whatever amount of money you save for fees for 30 days from the time it's there. And if the um, time frame of wherever you put it is a year, then for the year. So you can't say that I have a $99 special, March 1st, and then when too many people answer, drop it March 10th, you gotta go for a month. And those are the kinds of things that are easy to track. So they may, you know, find you. Okay, I love unduly manipulative or intrusive, especially when you think about some of the advertising. So you can't use ads that are designed to evoke emotion to make you afraid or unhappy or scared or worried and hire a lawyer. So you can show a picture of a crashed car in a telephone pole, but you can't show a picture of people bleeding on the ground around the crashed car. You can show a baby in a car, but you can't show a baby being catapulted through the window. That's a baby in a car. We're all used to a baby through the window is a little upsetting. You can't use an authority figure like a judge or someone from um, legal the, the law in some way recommending the lawyer. Even if you're using an actor, if you're using an actor, then A, you have to say it's an actor, not you, that, them, and B, you can't do it anyway. You can't use the voice of Taylor Swift to endorse you or to testify on your behalf, even though thanks to AI, you could find it and pay for it and get it. Because again, that's a jump too large to make. However, if there's a local DJ in your neighborhood or a local television anchor or someone who has a sideline where they um, do the voiceover for your ad or whatever, you can do that. It's presumed that that local 
celebrity is not the same in terms of impact as Taylor Swift. And then you cannot offer consumers an economic incentive to hire you. You can't offer them an economic incentive to review your advertising and tell you whether it works. You can offer discounted fees for work that's done as long as you say what it is. If you have limited um, work, you know, you'll do just this part and then they do the next part or whatever. You can have fees for that that are, are um, fees by, by the task, but you can't say, um, if you hire me, I'll, um, I'll deduct 20%, unfair. So then they, on, in the rules, which is really funny, they offer 20 versions of what they think are safe. So you can have the, your photo there. That's pretty safe. No one's going to be afraid of that. The scales of justice, you know, a foreclosure sign, a car accident, um, uh, a couple fighting, but nicely. You can't have a, you can't have marital rape shown. Again, emotion. So it limits you in terms of what you can use visually to pull a person into your ad. And the good thing about that is it limits everybody. However, go to that website and see what they do in some states. It's really funny. So you also um, can't say that, suppose you're solo, you can't say that um, you have associates if you're counting the people who work with you in one of the um, executive um, offices where you you know you you either pay for the answering service or you pay for rooms or you pay for space whatever you can't say that because you're not you also can't say that you have of counsel unless those people as in people who um, uh, help you and are so affiliated with you have an ongoing relationship that has real content to it. It can't be an ongoing relationship where for five years, no one ever used you. Again, that doesn't count. So you need to be very careful about that. So all of these things suggest to me that you all better read 4.13, 14, and 15, because it has a lot to do with what you can say or write. So if you think that that is specific, oh my goodness, you would think it was a marketing 101 course. So of course, all ads have to have the name of a lawyer. And that includes on your website because in the, in the footer, because our websites are considered advertising. And then unlike others, many other states, including my own New York, you only have to say the city, town, or county where you have a bona fide office. A bona fide office is not an executive um, uh, shared office space where you rent a room when you're doing a deposition. It's a place where law is enacted on a regular everyday basis. So what this does in New York, we have a rule that you can't be a lawyer without a physical location. And so what many people do is they use um, these, these executive workspaces and they get their mail picked up and they go in when they want to have a meeting. In Florida, that wouldn't fly. In New York, they'd fine with them. As long as it has an address, et cetera. In New York, you have to give the address. In Florida, you don't. You just have to give the general location. So in that part, it's easier. Then they go through ad nauseum, how the text has to be. And it always must be clear and legible. That means nothing really smaller than um, 11 point because most people find it hard to read things that are teeny print. Think about footnotes are usually seven point type. So anything that you have to say showing it's an advertisement, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, um, has to be written in similar or larger size to the, the message itself. If it's a solicitation being sent to specific people, it must be larger in size 
and in bright colors so they don't miss it. If you're speaking to someone, then you have to use the same volume, tone, and speed when you give when you say that this is considered an advertisement by the Florida Bar as if you're talking about the, the content. If, as many um, firms do, they have um, ads in Spanish language newspapers where half is in English and half is in Spanish, then you have to put the advertising language in both English and Spanish. If you're doing unsolicited mail or you're mailing anything, even an invitation to an event, you have to put the word advertisement in big bright colors on the envelope. It has to be on the material itself on every page. And if you're doing an email, it has to be a first word in the subject line. So let's think about that in terms of marketing. Do people you're marketing to really want the first word to be, I mean, you want them to open it. And the first word is advertisement. And then it tells you what it's about. And this is kind of, as a marketing person, I'll tell you that we would not tell you to do that. It's not so hot. Then you have to include in all unsolicited email and snail mail, unsolicited meaning the person didn't ask to get it, uh, information on the person sending it, on their relevant experience, their expertise, their background. So basically there has to be a mini um, resume profile paragraph at the end of every email, unsolicited. And Carol, I'm gonna just take a second to let you know we're at the 1236 mark. Okay, I think we're doing okay. Uh, yeah, I'm right at halfway. So now they have this very short rule that says what you can do. And again, think it's all facts. You can say anything about yourself or your law firm that you would think to put in a resume, plus those aspirational things that we discussed earlier, plus um, intent sentences. So those are the things you can put in. If you accept credit cards, you can say that and say which cards. If you accept credit cards but make them pay the credit card fee, you need to say so. If you have a fee schedule, you can talk about that. Again, if you have it, what you need to do is you need to keep it for 30 days. And then you're allowed to say common salutary language, that is best wishes, um, regards, thank you, et cetera, et cetera. Again, plain vanilla. So basically from their point of view, in order to keep it, traceable, trackable, professional. It's the no ice cream, no sprinkles, no hot fudge sauce. So the job of marketing people is to show you how to get hot fudge sauce, and we'll do that in a little bit. However, they understand that it's the modern world and that in order to get known, you have to promote yourself. But guys, there's a lot of lawyers and you have to do it. So you can pay for it. You can pay the cost of advertising, in magazines or newsletters or whatever, or um, on you know, through Google on various sites. You can pay people like me to prepare the material for you. You can pay to be in lawyer referral programs where you pay a fee and become part of a group. And then potential uh, clients who come there um, are, are matched with the people in the group. You can, of course, use a legal aid agency or a prepaid legal services plan or the bar's referral service. So you can always do that. So they understand that you're not gonna necessarily do it. You're not experts in that. You're gonna wanna pay someone. However, you can't give anything of value to anyone who's a referral source. You can't pay for the cost of an ad for another person, a lawyer who's not in your firm. And you cannot allow a non-lawyer to pay for you for advertising. All of those are considered to um, impinge upon the, the independence of a lawyer. And one of the things that all of the ethics rules value very highly is that lawyers in working with their clients are free to use their judgment to make the best possible kinds of decisions about the resources available. So anything that looks like 
because you gave them money, they could have some ideas about what they want to do that impinge on your independence. You can't do it. No, when you think about it that way, it's perhaps odd, but it makes sense. Now, in case that's not enough intrusion, the Bar Association in Florida has given themselves a lot of work because at least 20 days prior to any advertisement that you do online or um, through your website or on um, giving a, you know, sending out a form after a speech or something, they all have to go to the Bar Association 20 days prior so that they can be um, evaluated and accepted. If you send it in in time and 15 days go by, two weeks without hearing from them, you assume it's okay to go. Most people have a contact form on their website. Before you put it on your website, you need to run that by the Bar Association. The exemptions, again, are things that are so tight, so finite in their scope that there's no chance for them to be misunderstood. So we all know what Tombstone's announcements are. Charlie Brown joined the firm of Hello Dolly. Um, charity sponsorships, you see those names listed in charity um, handouts all the time. Again, as I said, communication that's mailed only to your clients and to other lawyers, or if a, somebody, lawyer, non-lawyer, whatever, requests information from you. Those are not under this rule. So the filing requirements are a pain in the butt because it's not only the text of what you're doing itself. You also have to tell them how you're going to disseminate it, how often, over what time period, um, who's responsible for it, all those kinds of things. And then you pay $150 for each um, piece that you submit. So you have to submit, say, blog posts. So that could get expensive, particularly if you're starting out and you're a solo, but this is how you want to go. If they quote unquote catch you not using it, then when they review what you had not sent to them, it's 250 for each one of those. And the ads, the material that is covered by this has to be kept for three years. So you need to keep the content of it and then when and where you used it. If it was a solicitation, meaning you sent it to specific recipients, then you need to keep a list of their names and addresses for three years. Now, in New York, no one ever asked for that stuff, even though you could. I don't know if they do in Florida or not, but it must fill up a lot of filing cabinets. So suppose you want direct contact. This is a place where Florida um, separates from most rational states. Because in Florida, you can't solicit a person that you don't know for the purpose of as they say, pecuniary gain, as I say, work. Um, doesn't matter how you do it. But if you're directing something to a specific set of recipients that you know, because of their characteristics, which you know, have a certain problem, um, will need a certain kind of law, that's a solicitation. So you live in Greenberg, North, uh, North Carolina, and you know that there's a lot of foreclosure in to certain suburbs. So you buy the addresses and the names of everybody in those suburbs, you send to those specific recipients because you know it's quite possible that they're in that need category. So you do that. The other thing is they protect you in solicitation from um, the caricature of the PI lawyer who runs after the ambulance screaming, I can help you, I can help you. Uh, we don't have too many of those anymore, but uh, that's what it is. So if a person's been in an accident, you can't approach them for 30 days. And that's true in most states. Uh, oh, and also solicitations come under the bar review. But another thing about this that I found really interesting is if you meet somebody because you're giving a speech and, and one of you links with me on LinkedIn or you meet people in your networking group, but you're not practicing law with them. You're not giving them legal um, information or you're, they're not um, working with you. Then they count 
as solicitate so people who are being solicited. They don't count as people that you know the way you know other lawyers and your own clients. So that means that the group that you can freely send to is quite small compared to other states. Your turn. All right. So question being launched. It takes me so long to get to them. Got it. All right. Audience question number two. Do your marketing materials or website violate any of these rules? And we'll give folks a little bit of time to answer. Thanks for those of you who are participating and putting stuff in. Makes makes uh just makes it more fun for me and Carol. <laughs> and remember, we don't know who you are, so you can honest. Yeah, yeah, it's all anonymous. When you see these rules, it is so easy for an average normal human being to break them. It's, yep. It's mind boggling how easy it is. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll and share the results because we're at about 30 seconds. So it looks like 91% say no, and we have 9% that say yes. Okay. So that's good. But I wonder what you all are doing to jazz up your websites. Okay. Feel free to add in, in a, a chat, everybody. Feel free to talk about it. We're happy to hear. Okay. Now let's talk about a few things that matter if you want to create your own firm. Because many people do things like legal aid for um, one to 10 years and then want to go off and do part of it at, uh, in, a, in their own firm rather than trying to join the pro bono section of a large firm or be a smaller pro bono on your own. So let's look at what happens then. Next question is quick. Your turn. Yeah, there you go. All right, audience question three. Which of these firm names is permissible for a solo attorney? Option one being Law Offices of Peter Abel. Option two being Law Office of Peter Abel and Associates. Option three being Peter Abel Real Estate Law Firm. I'm gonna give it a few more minutes. We have folks that are still chiming in. All right. We got folks still chiming in. All right, I'm going to share the results. Thank you all for participating. So 73% say option one, and a split even of 13% for each say option two or option three. The real answer is option three. The trouble with option one is that S on offices. Solos don't know. usually have more than one office, particularly when they're starting out. So you can't say offices. Even if you're in an executive suite and they have four offices and you can use all of them, you can't say it. It's your office, one law office. Wow. You can't say an associates because nine times out of 10, you haven't got the close linkage that you need to say they're associates or of counsel. Because once you say that about someone, you have to clear your um, conflict checks with them and their clients. And that can get to be annoying and can increase the number you know, rapidly. But you can say Peter Abel Real Estate Law Firm because you're allowed to have trade names. So, okay, so now why does no one work? Uh, okay. okay, so firm names. Firm names can include current members of a firm, even if they're deceased or retired, but they have to have been practicing members of the firm. Firm names cannot include the name of public officers still in office until they return back to practicing in the firm. And then when they do, you can't call them judge so-and-so in your market materials. You have to say Charlie Brown, formerly judge on the 12th circuit or whatever it is. 
So you can't make it easy for people to figure out that you have these um, experienced legal professionals in your firm. You can say a trade name unless it's misleading, back again to the beginning. And you can use the same name in many places. But if you're in multiple jurisdictions and some of your lawyers can practice in them and some cannot, then like in New York where some are in New Jersey, um, you have to say that these lawyers can practice in both. These can practice only in New York and these only in New Jersey. So again, factual, checkable, truthful. Next thing is qualified providers. Um, New York is a quagmire for this. Yours is much better. So it's anybody, any organization, any entity that you may or may not pay for the direct or indirect referral of prospects. So it could be a group that matches them up like um, Avo or um, some of the other online matching services. It could be a pooled program that job is to connect lawyers and prospects like Martindale. It could be um, media listings or directories. And it could be just um, a website that gives you leads and tips, a very casual kind of thing. All of those. It's fine to use any of those as long as you don't give divide fees with them on the basis of what you get. And so Avo had to, um, 10 years or so ago, when they first brought it out, they had to change their program because it looked like they were charging a fee for the referrals, even though they said it was a general fee and it raised tons of angst in New York. So, okay, those are the rules and we can see how they could mess you up in marketing, but how do they help you? They help you a lot. So they should be the basis of your brand, of your image. They should be how you talk about what you do because law is important to you, because you wanna use law to help people have better lives. You want to use it as part of your elevator pitch. You wanna use it in your stories. You know, show yourself as the great defender or the great innovator or whatever, but use the ethics, use professionalism to help you build it. It has enormous meaning to the average person. So this is your last audience question. And I, I'm smart this time. I left it up so I can just press the button. Wow. All right. And of course, by the last one, I get it. Um, audience, audience question number four. Do you have a filled out LinkedIn profile? Choices being yes or no. And we have folks who are answering. So far, it's an overwhelming yes. I'll give it about five more seconds. Good. And there we go. So I'm gonna end the poll now. Thank you all for participating. And I'll share the results. 92% say yes and Great. eight okay. say no. I'm gonna give you some tips on it. So hopefully that'll be a help. Okay. Oops. Okay. So uh, in the internet world, the uh, social sites like Facebook, Instagram don't count for the advertising rules. LinkedIn, whoops, I just saw the, <laughs> so you told me where that was and I just found it, right? Um, LinkedIn, which I spelled wrong, I apologize. Never. Uh, uh, is a commercial site. The purpose of LinkedIn is to make connections for the purpose of building your business. Again, the information on these sites follows the same kind of things results, skills, reputation, uh, record, if it's all verifiable. And social media posts, targeted ones, you send them from you to everybody who lives in town X, to everybody who's teenager, whatever, those um, are subject to the limitations we talked about. Now let's talk about LinkedIn for a minute because it's really important. Not only should you be on it, but you should be using it um, effectively. So the headline, the headline is not lawyer in ABC law firm. ABC law firm is already right up there on the front, on the right. You don't need it. 
Lawyer doesn't help you. It is um, assertive, client-focused, expert, legal practitioner or lawyer um, focused on helping clients um, who have had major accidents or medical um, mistakes. And then you also want to say where you are and how long you've done it. You have 250 characters. That means every alphabetical letter, every piece of punctuation, and every space between letters. But it's still, you can say a whole lot. What you want it to do is you want it to be have enough specifics in it that the bot that links you up with other people notices it and uses it. And then the second most important is the about section. About does not mean you say you're a lawyer in the ABC law firm and that you practice um, real estate law or uh, employment law or whatever. No, it is a section about why you became a lawyer. It's about who you are as a person. Why did you become a lawyer? How do you implement the why in your everyday work? How do you view working with clients? What um, is the secret sauce you use in your practice areas? And so here, remember that you can be aspirational and you can fudge things. You know, could, would, should, might, maybe. And you want to write that. At the bottom of that, because LinkedIn is considered advertising, you want to put in Florida, LinkedIn is considered advertising, period. There is no place on LinkedIn to put it as a separate entity. So that's why I tell my clients, just put it at the bottom there. No one's going to see it. Clients are going to laugh at it and other lawyers are going to smile. So that's it. So if you're on LinkedIn, oh, make sure you have a picture of yourself, not a picture of your children or your dog or your house or your garden, yourself and a fairly recent one, as in within the last five years. There is nothing worse, particularly for men, than seeing a great picture of them with a full head of hair, and in real life, they're bald. The point of it is, is you want to be able to find them later. Then you want to join groups. I know I have like five minutes left. You want to join groups, groups that you like because they do what you do. They do crewing, they do museum tours, they do travel, whatever. And then groups where you might find your potential clients, and then groups where you can learn about your own areas and, and keep up. You can join 100 groups. And what you want to do once you've joined them is you want to pick a few at, at a time. And for a couple of months, you want to look at them once a week. And then you want to answer one of the discussions that's going on when you look at it. The answer is not an emoji. The answer has to add value because you're projecting yourself as a classy lawyer who can help people. So the value is, I agree with your point, but I agree with your point because I think you should consider like that. Short, sweet, but by doing that, you project yourself as um, a thinking um, in, in touch kind of lawyer. And then when you send your own text out, Make sure you do the three things on the, the right side of the slide. Mentions. So you're going to mention that Carol and uh, Alexis were at the same event that you're talking about. So you put at Carol, at Alexis, and then it will come to us. And we will be able to pass it on or answer it or whatever. Hashtags are categories of people that you want to see it because of the content because of what you want to do with it, whatever. Now, you can look on LinkedIn and find out how many people are in the hashtags. Go to the help part and say, how large is the, um, is the number of people under hashtag divorce lawyer? I'll just tell you it's thousands, thousands and thousands. And then you want to put in URLs, especially of your own website, where they can see more about it. In order to play on LinkedIn, you need a minimum of 250 connections. Most of us who have, have played and have been on a long time have between 500 and 1,000. 
this is important before I end because I'm almost finished, but okay. Clients look at hiring lawyers like they look at buying the best toothpaste, laundry soap, shoes, whatever. And so they are looking for comments from other people who have used you to say why they like you. Now, a human cannot say they like you because you had a great legal um, approach because humans are not supposed to understand enough about law to say that. So what they can talk about is your client's service uh, posture. Um, they can talk about the result they got. They can talk about um, how it felt working with you. They can talk about you thought that they were, so they could say that you were able to answer any question and to help them to get the most effective result. You could, they can say that. You want that out there because they're going to use it. In fact, Clio, which does an annual with state of lawyers, in 2019 said that what clients want to know about is you, is you, the lawyer, your credentials and your practice areas, but they also, 70%, want to know how you work in terms of the process that you use, and a, and a client could talk to that, and they want to know how you charge. They also, 83%, want to know if you're responsive. Now, responsive is related to age. My age, I think responsive is 36 hours. Send Gen Z thinks it's two minutes. So you have to think about how you're going to respond depending on who you're going after. If you're going after Gen Z and you can't respond in two minutes because you're in court or you're doing whatever, then you want to have a bot on your website that does respond and that says, I'm sorry, the lawyer really does want to talk with you, but he's in court and she's in court and we'll get back to you in whatever you want to say. They also want immediate answers. Immediate again, depends on how old you are. Um, they also want to know what they want to know. So if they ask a question and you won't answer it, you lose. And then Two thirds of them want their lawyer to be friendly or to at least appear friendly. That's probably a hard one. So you need to encourage getting testimonials. Of course, again, you can't pay for them. But once you get in the habit, so for instance, you could put it at the bottom of your invoices where it says, um, you know, the, the highest form of flattery is a recommendation from a satisfied client, something like that. Okay, there we are. Thank you very much. Awesome. If it didn't make sense or you want to talk about something else, this is how to find me. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carol. It's incredible to me how you pack so much information and in the time that we have with you. It like blows my mind. Thank um, you. Yeah, it's awesome. So folks, um, I know we're at 102. Um, I won't keep you all long. I just want to remind everyone, I typically do announce the CLE code at the end of um, each session. However, this session is in combination with the following session that we have on June 12th. So the CLE code will be announced at the end of that session, but stick with us. At the end of that session, you'll get the code for two general, one professional, and one ethics credit. So we're really packing it in. Um, I appreciate you all joining us today. I look forward to seeing you on June 12th. If you are already registered for this, which you are because you're here, you will automatically be registered for June 12th. So don't worry, you don't have to do anything. But my email address is up there in the chat. If anybody has any questions, I you can easily reach out to me. And Carol, thank you again, uh, really teaching us how to navigate this networking niche and niche. And I've said this throughout you know, our, our training series, I'm a, an extroverted person, but the techniques that you've taught us throughout really shows how important it is to be proactive and um, methodical and really look at everything that you're doing with a purpose. So thank you so much for teaching us. Okay. All right, we'll see you. See you all in June, I hope. Bye. Yeah. Bye.